Uh, my name is my name is Indika Rajapaksa from University of Michigan. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this special event. I'm very excited to introduce to introduce Dr. Lee, Leland Hartwell. Uh, Dr. Hartwell received his PhD from MIT in 1964. In 2001, he won a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discoveries related to the genetics of cell division. He was a former president of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And Dr. Hartwell now directs the Center for Sustainable Health at Arizona State University's Biodesign Institute. And he's the Virginia G. Pepper Chair of Personalized Medicine. I have known Dr. Hartwell since my days as a postdoc at Fred Hutch, one of my scientific heroes. Working with him on a science outreach has also inspired me as a teacher. He has developed a program called Science of Me that aims to provide middle school students and teachers an authentic science experience by exploring sensory perception. On behalf of the University of Michigan, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Hartwell for, for, for this talk today entitled A Role for Doing Science in Science Education. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. Leland Hartwell. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartwell. Hey, well, thank you, Andika, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I imagine that uh, many, most of you probably are science educators, and uh, I really value the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Uh, because I hope you can help me think about this. <clears throat> I'm, I feel like I'm at a very early stage in this project, uh, and there's a lot to learn about it. Um, so what, what motivates me is, uh, for the last few years is the realization that um, science education rarely uh, gives students an opportunity to actually do what I consider science. Um, students learn a lot about what other scientists have discovered, but it seems to me they rarely have the opportunity to actually do science themselves. Um, Indika, how's the volume coming across here? Okay. Indika, are we okay on the volume? Okay. Very good here. Yeah, very okay. good. Very good. Okay. Great, thanks. All right. So, um, so what I wanna do is to try to um, clarify what I mean by doing science. And one way that I have found to, um, I think, satisfy that desire uh, for relatively naive students. And uh, ho hopefully you can help me think about this. So the first thing I wanna do is, so I wanna share my screen here with you. I have a presentation that'll help me get through this. Okay, so what I would ca I call so I call this doing science with students. You're a genius. Um, so I want to contrast the concepts of doing science with the concept of learning science. And for me, doing science is about exploring the unknown. And this is the critical distinction, I think. What? Live? I'm going to mute everybody so because get rid of this noise. Okay. <laughs> um, so you're all muted for me now, but uh, I'll open it back up when we want questions. Um, so this is the fundamental thing, I think, that, that doing science is about exploring the unknown. And that that's a very, very different phenomenon from exploring what's already known. 
Uh, that's the crux of the matter. Learning science is about the history of what other scientists have discovered by doing science. Uh, and I think that both of these things are clearly necessary in a scientist's education, but that the doing part is, has been almost entirely neglected before graduate school. So that students um, decide to become scientists without ever really experiencing what it's about and are often drawn into science because they're good at getting grades on tests. Whereas the people who, um, who will be good at doing science are the ones who like to tinker in the laboratory. And tinkering is very different than learning textbook information. So I think we're, we, we, by neglecting doing in our education, we may be doing a big disservice to students in selecting for the wrong qualities. Um, I, I like to give an example of, you know, if we're training a student to be an artist, would we only expect them to learn the history of art? Obviously not. We would expect them to paint or sculpt or whatever it is they want to do as an artist. And similarly with a musician, we wouldn't expect them to just listen to music. We'd expect them to learn how to play an instrument. And so should a student scientist only learn science history? I think you'd agree with me that the answer is no. And I presume you have all been exploring your own sort of solutions to this problem. But the big, the big question I think in trying to solve this problem is to clarify what we mean by the unknown. Where do we find the unknown that we can explore? Um, and I'd like to take a relatively precise definition of this. I think to a scientist, the known is, are things that are predictable like eclipses. If we can quantitatively predict something, that's the goal of science and that's used as the criterion that we actually understand something. Predicting the future is a pretty impressive feat. Um, and until we can do that, we don't really accept the theory as valid. That leaves us with the unknown, which are the things which are unpredictable. They're not things we don't know about. They're things we just can't predict. So earthquakes are an example of things we can't quantitatively predict and therefore don't understand. Now, I think there are two big challenges to helping students do science as relatively naive students and in relatively large numbers. And the first one is that doing science often requires a lot of knowledge before you can understand what's known and what's not known, before you can get to that edge of the unknown. And take, for example, black holes. If a student wanted to think uh, about black holes creatively, they'd have to learn a lot of mathematics first. Um, the second problem is that doing science often requires a lot of very expensive equipment. And uh, that usually means a laboratory. So that really limits the number of students that we can um, allow to explore this experience if it requires a lot of expensive equipment. And this is a challenge always with uh, science laboratories where we try to, I think, present relatively routine uh, experiences with standard equipment. And I think confuse the idea 
that learning to use an instrument is equivalent to doing science. So where can we find phenomena that are unpredictable, that don't require a lot of knowledge beforehand so that naive students can experience it and, and uh, have the experience themselves and that don't require a lot of expensive equipment. So that was a challenge that I uh, wrestled with for some time. And what I came up with is our perception of the world around us. That is our sensory perception and our cognition are um, very mysterious. Uh, they've been studied for hundreds of years, of course, but they still remain incredibly mysterious. There's, of course, a great deal of work now going on trying to um, take a reductionist approach to how we sense our environments, how we see and how we hear um, with um, neurophysiology and brain mapping and various kinds of things and imaging. Um, but the reductionist approach has not yet answered the problem. There are loads of things known, but nothing which really coalesces into explaining how we see or how we hear. So sensory perception and the cognitive uh, associates that allow us to make sense of our world provide hundreds of phenomena that remain qualitative and can't be quantitatively predicted. So they satisfy this need um, of mine that I define as being still in the realm of qualitative and therefore still in the realm of science to be explored. The second thing that this approach uh, supplies is uh, most of the expensive equipment that we need because our eyes and our ears become our laboratory. They are enormously um, amazing instruments that we can study and learn things about. Even though we use them every day, it's surprising how little we understand about the way they work and how easy it is to demonstrate to students that there are surprising phenomena going on. So here's a simple experiment I like to do with students about our peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is that vision that you are left with if you have macular degeneration, which um, eliminates the central part of the retina where our high acuity vision occurs which is actually a very small area in, in our central vision, only about six degrees of our roughly 180 uh, visual uh, field is of high acuity. Um, so what I like students to do is to go sit somewhere um, where there's a lot of activity going on and put on a pair of glasses um, that, um, uh, have the central part of the glasses blocked out. So you can only see out the edges, uh, the left edge and the right edge. And just sit there for a while and see what you observe. And I, I recommend this to anybody because although we are using our peripheral vision every day, I think you might actually be surprised at, at how it works because um, our attention is almost always on our central vision. And if something attracts our attention in the periphery, we focus our central vision on it. So we're always accustomed to thinking that our consciousness is in our central vision, but it isn't really, it's in both. So the first thing you notice about your peripheral vision is that it has very poor acuity. You can see things happening in your periphery but you can't really tell who they are or what they are very well. Colors are even hard to uh, <clears throat> determine unless they're very bright. But what you notice 
is that you're highly sensitive to motion. If there's movement, your peripheral vision is very aware of it. Another thing you might notice is that there's a greater awareness to sound. Normally, we put most of our attention on our central vision, but if that's blocked, then you begin to realize that your um, attention is also on both your peripheral vision and your hearing, and that these are how you make sense of what's going on in the world. And most of the time, we are just um, deciding not to pay attention <laughs> to the things that are going on on the periphery or sound that is reaffirming that we know what's going on and are familiar with it. Um, but our attention is, a, is a paying attention to these things all the time and deciding when to interrupt the attention on our central vision and distract us because something interesting that we should pay attention to is going on in the periphery. So what is doing science aside from exploring things that are unknown in the sense of not being quantitatively predictable. I think science is a relatively simple process. We observe phenomena um, that interest us. We ask questions about those phenomena. And that's something that of course children do all the time. The youngest children will drive you nuts asking why, 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 why? So observing things and asking questions about them is a very natural human activity. Science comes in when we turn those questions into experiments. And then we um, observe quantitative results from those experiments and try to make sense out of that data. And this, I think, is in contrast to the kinds of laboratory courses that we have for science where students are trying to get the right answer. The important part, I think, the fun part of science is the mystery. And it's at the beginning, at the phenomena, at the questions. The experiment and the results are relatively mechanical. Uh, can be highly creative and highly demanding, but nevertheless, it seems to me the intellectually creative part is really turning phenomena into questions. And in laboratory courses, we often eliminate that part altogether. In lecture courses, we eliminate that part altogether often as well and go directly to the experiments and the results. And that I think is a shame. Um, so we found a way to um, make experimentation with vision and hearing um, very accessible to students uh, at low expense and uh, yet uh, quite quantitatively with a, a beautiful program called PsychoPi that was designed for doing psychology experiments. So here is an experiment about peripheral vision. Uh, I can't show you the actual experiment because you have to be properly situated in front of your computer. But basically what we do is we show a letter in the center of the screen where your central vision would be located. And that's very small. And we ask you what letter that is, and you respond on the keyboard. And the ability to see that small letter, as I mentioned, is uh, only present in about six degrees of your central vision. And then what we do is we flash letters on the sides or the corners and ask you what letter you saw. 
And if those letters that are flashing on the side are brief, let's say less than 30 milliseconds, then if they're also small, you won't be able to see them because your central vision won't be there and you won't have time to move it. And so we can ask how big does a letter have to be on your periphery in order for you to see it? And even though your computer screen is only about 16 degrees off center, at even that distance, your peripheral vision is about eightfold worse than your central vision. That is the letter on the periphery needs to be eightfold bigger. So we get a quantitative measure very quickly of an interesting phenomenon. That leads to a question. Um, normally we move our vision to put our central vision where we wanna see something. So how long does it take for our central vision to move? That's called the saccade, the eye movement. And you can measure that by leaving the peripheral letters small and leaving them on for a longer period of time. And we have the experiment set up so that students can set this time themselves and they can experiment with a variety of times and determine the time that allows them to move their eyes to the periphery and place the small letter in their central vision. And that takes about 200 milliseconds, which is actually a fairly long time, given how our vision works. So uh, with, a, with a computer and the PsychoPy program, we can determine interesting things quantitatively. For example, that objects 16 degrees off center must be eight times bigger than those on center for our peripheral vision to resolve them and that it takes about 200 milliseconds to move your eyes from the center of the screen to the periphery, to the just 16 degrees away. <clears throat> and the way our vision works is that our eyes bounce around. So that if we're looking at, let's say a face, and this is from Wikipedia, um, and you track the eyes with a, a vision, an eye tracker that looks at the, reflections from the retina and can tell where your eye is looking, um, you, get, you see that we, our eyes bounce back and forth. These lines are saccades. And actually during a saccade, you don't see anything. Your, your vision is blind while you saccade. And then you focus on either the eyes, the nose or the mouth if you're looking at a face. When we read, um, our eyes jump across the line of print, um, stopping at appropriate places to make sense of what the words are. And this is something you can observe and students observe one another. If you observe, sit in front of somebody who's reading a book and just watch their eyes, you'll see these jumps take place and you can actually count the number of jumps that take place across the line and tied, time the saccades that way. So what's neat is the results from these experiments raise new questions and really quite mysterious questions. For example, how do we perceive a scene? Imagine that you walk into a room, the door opens and you see this crowded room and all sorts of things going on. How do we actually perceive that? Do we do what we might imagine from the previous experiments where you look in turn at different things around the room, scanning it with your central vision where you have high acuity? That would take 200 milliseconds for everything you looked at. And to actually scan a scene of about 60 degrees by 30 degrees, uh, perhaps a typical scene that we make sense of, it would take about 10 seconds. Yet if you actually do the experiment of just flashing a scene on the computer screen, you get the impression of what's there very rapidly. And so something else is going on, something besides the mechanics of our vision 
that allows us to apprehend or perceive a complex scene, not in all its detail, but in various aspects, for example, of the numbers of things that are present, the kinds of things that are present. And so this raises another question that students can explore. What do we perceive quickly? That's a phenomenon called scene analysis. <clears throat> now you might ask, aren't these known phenomena? Are we really exploring the unknown? Yes, the answer is that the phenomena are known, but they're not known in the quantitative sense that um, I think separates what is, I would call unknown in science from what's known. These kind of phenomena are not quantitatively predictable because there's such an enormous number of variables in any particular experiment you might do. The real world is just full of variety. How long you might time things, how big they are, how colorful they are, how many there are, all kinds of variables that experiments and students can explore. The second enormous variable is individual variation. These are called top-down variables. People come to a scene with their own history, their own expectations and their own goals. And two different people will explore it in a different way. It can be shown, for example, by these um, experiments where you uh, do eye tracking and follow what a person observes in a scene, that if you, if you tell them different things before they track, they'll look at different things. That is, they're pre-programmed to care about one thing or another. So in the sense that students might know what to expect from an experiment, these experiments are, I think, entirely in the unknown and satisfy that need I have for wanting students to be able to do those interesting parts of science to explore mystery, ask questions about phenomena and think of experiments. Okay, so in summary, <laughs> um, doing science I think is easy uh, because our perception of the world, how we perceive our world is largely unknown because there are hundreds of phenomena well known and documented in psychology about our vision, our hearing, our taste, our touch, our memory, our attention, our cognition. And that students can have the experience of thinking about these phenomena and asking questions. And that I think is the really imaginative, humanly creative aspect of science. That's how humans are different. They ask questions and they think about how those questions can be uh, performed as experiments, how experiments can lead to results. And that with these very simple phenomena that anyone can do science. I wanna finish by just saying that I think the aspect of learning science, which is important, of course, we need to learn what science has previously discovered, that the aspect of learning science can better reflect the process of doing science. And let me just give you an example from Mendelian genetics. We all learn that Mendel discovered his rules of inheritance, uh, that each trait is governed by a gene from the mother and a gene from the father. And these rules are often taught uh, in high school or even earlier. And yet what's being taught is only the last of these four steps of the dance of science but that Mendel's laws could be made much more interesting 
and um, uh, I think much more understandable if we took the time to ask the question, what phenomena was Mendel exploring? What question did he ask and what result did he find? Because the phenomena that Mendel was exploring when he did his experiments was not unique. Many, many people were doing experiments at that time to try to discover how parents contributed um, to offspring. So the question was more about species. You know, why do pigeons produce pigeons and crows produce crows? And what most scientists were doing at that time in history was crossing different species, usually with plants because they're more fertile, uh, hybrid species are more fertile. And the typical result they obtained was that the hybrid looked somewhat like one parent and somewhat like another parent and no rules were derived because it didn't go any further. The reason it didn't go any further was because hybrid species are sterile. Now Mendel's question becomes pretty important because Mendel asked a different question. Mendel asked the question, how do small differences within the same species get inherited? A fundamentally different question, a brilliant question, a very human creative question. And he was able to explore that for several generations because the hybrid and uh, the crosses between parents were fertile and he could follow it for two generations. And it wasn't until the second generation that he got his answer of a three to one segregation. And notice that his result was quantitative. He counted things three to one. Okay, <laughs> so that's my story for today. Um, I'd love to hear from you, how you work with your students to explore aspects of doing science. Um, and I thank you for your time and attention. Oh, how do we unmute everybody? I think Dr. Hartfield, we can do that. And, uh, okay, very good, very good. <laughs> I think people can unmute as they uh, would like to talk. Um, yeah. Previously, every single person was muted in the in the call. So if you if you'd like to say something, please unmute yourself. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hartfield. Now, if you have questions, please uh, ask from Dr. Hartfield. Dr. Hartwell, this is Erdogan Gullar. I am an engineering faculty member. And I was reflecting upon the fact that um, 80, in the 80s, at least, we were lamenting the fact that we no longer got students from farms or you know, kids who tinkered with things. And all we ended up we are getting even today our students who are sent to engineering simply because they are good in math from high schools and this ends up causing an interesting problem we have a department of undecided where one third of our students don't know what type of engineering they would like to specialize in well into their junior year. And, and many of them really have forgotten. You know, in the old days, we had cars that you could open the hood and do things, tinker. Uh, well, you can't open the hood of a car nowadays and tinker with anything. So sure. that, that has been a serious problem at least in engineering, and I, I don't think we've really found a good solution. The only thing that has come up is basically 
most of our departments, chemical engineering included, we brought a design course where they had to make things. Product design and require them to produce something. Uh, that isn't totally tinkering with the unknown, but in many cases, it has led to um, good results in the sense that students eventually learn that if you have to produce something new, you have to tinker, you have to learn, uh, go back to the literature, see what everyone else has done before you. And the reaction has been very positive from that point. Uh, obviously, it is a challenge with very large classes uh, in the sense that these classes, at least in my own department, they have to be year long uh, as opposed to their normal design, which is a paper design. Uh, we have to get them to commit to a year long course and actually uh, we select them, which maybe isn't a good thing, but we want to judge their desire to do something different other than the ordinary. But having listened to you, I, I think I'm thinking a lot more about simpler things, <laughs> simpler science. And I, I suspect I'm going to apply many of what you said to my growing daughter, <laughs> who's really not even in elementary school right now. But thank you. That was eye-opening in terms of simplifying tinkering. Yeah, I think it's a lost art. And um, it's certainly, you know, if the, the nature of what happens when you want to do an experiment, right? You have to get things together and try to think of how they work and how you can make sense of things and use your hands in a way that um, we, we don't give students enough opportunity to do. Uh, hi, Lee. Hello. How are you? I'll, Very good, uh, Sri. Uh, two, qu two quick questions and a quick comment. First, do you have a set of exercises that you can share with other parents and teachers here that they can try out? Number two, do you ha have you done any exercises that fuse uh, you know, two sensors, ear and eye? And third comment is that um, Schrodinger lot of, wrote a lot about these kind of things. Thank you. Over to you. Right, yeah. Uh, in terms of um, things that we can share, um, <clears throat> um, we're just in that transition right now. I'm working with a bunch of teachers in India, and um, uh, and I've you know worked with a variety of teachers here as well. And um, what we need to do is to um, put our experiments and demonstrations and things online so that you can access them through the web rather than needing this program on your computer. And uh, we've, we've just been doing that and it works really well. And I think in a short time, we'll have things that are very easy to access and use. Um, with regard to Schrodinger, yes, um, he talks about um, uh, how, color um, means nothing to a physicist, but uh, color means everything to a person. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I forget the third thing you, you mentioned. <laughs> oh, uh, it, it is, uh, have you done any experiments which kind of fuse the you know, seeing and the listening? Oh. Multi-sensor multi fusion. Yes. Um, Yes, um, I, I think it's um, uh, it's interesting. You can certainly ask um, where where your attention is. I mean, what's really phenomenally interesting and limiting, I think, about our attention is it really can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And so, you know, if you're listening to a conversation. Um, it's harder to uh, do something, some visual task. 
So you can do um, competitions between visual and acoustic tasks. But there are times when they cooperate as well. So we've done experiments where people are talking and there's white noise and it's hard to hear them. And you can show that you can hear them better if you can see them as well as listen to them. If you can see their, their mouth. Um, so yeah, that, that relationship between the visual and the hearing is, can be explored in several dimensions. Uh, hi, this is Tom Gardner. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist and so I particularly appreciated your illustrations. Uh, but your broader point is, is right on. At least in medicine, most of the people who end up, who qualify to get into highly competitive medical schools are the ones who since high school have succeeded in memorizing facts and regurgitating them on tests. And uh, so there's this huge built-in bias to being right and being very risk adverse. Um, and in fact, the, when I give, I give a talk about the importance of clinicians in medical innovation, and um, I tell them, I, I speak about how the, the emphasis on facts is way too important because facts is merely an acronym for the fiction at the current time. And uh, that, so the fact that, you know, the tinkers, as you say, are the people who are willing to be wrong and who thrive on that. And, and virtually every successful scientist has succeeded because they were wrong at some point. And um, so to only select people who are, to pe select people who are only comfortable with being right uh, discourages innovation. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for that. I think that's very true. And that's uh, a real uh, debilitating effect of our educational system that people who, when they were young, were very curious and willing to be wrong, become much more hesitant as they get further in their education. <clears throat> Can I jump in? I'm Jim York from Maryland, mathematician. Uh, from your commentators' uh, comments, we see that the a reason for following your approach is to get people into the sciences more effectively. But I would like to change the direction of the question, and that is, how do we produce a literate population who will accept climate science as something which has been you can change the topic other than climate science, but where, where all of the scientists agree and a couple people come up and say, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. And so no, use your common sense. Don't listen to the scientists. And so you get an entire population denying, the entire government, shall we say, denying the existence. How do we use your approach to get people to understand be, be able to understand what science is? It's a different question, I think. Yeah, it's a wonderful question and a really pertinent and very, very important question in our times. And, um, you know, I, I obviously don't know the, the answer to that, but I think if we could um, help uh, students understand where knowledge comes from and the tedious process by which it's obtained and how those things which are accepted are consensus things. That is science is consensus building and there must be broad acceptance within the body of science to accept something as a, as a fact. Then I think, um, you know, maybe they would appreciate better uh, what expert information, you know, has to offer. Um, um, I, um, I, I am a student from the EEB department and I have a uh, question with regard to the program that you are proposing. Have you thought about, because the purpose is to make the students kind of learn how to do science, have you like decide some way to track the outcomes of the students 
uh, going through this process. I am asking this because there's a good deal of efforts in, in the subject of studying the economics of science of how various different policy or programs will facilitate the outcome of scientific educations and even scientific productivity. And in the past, we relies on naturalized experiments. And it's very difficult to teasing apart causation and correlation. You've got to do a lot of controls. A recent example is a program called Association Training Program. Now that program produced Anthony Fauci, but to, to show that it is effective, you've got to go back to look at the data and show that those programs are, are good at producing great scientists and, and it's, it's very messy data. So I do wonder when you design these kind of programs that you thought about like do some records or at, or at the very outset to testing the difference between students that go through that programs and not going through that program in a sort of quasi randomized way. Um, I'm afraid I didn't understand the question. It, maybe it wasn't a question. Maybe you were just telling us about a program. So my question is, you, you, you have like design a scenario that proposing would help students enhance their ability in doing science. Have you decided experiment to measure the scientific ability of students after the programs versus before so that this is an effective program in, to oh, prove sure. in a scientific way? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think um, this is a really interesting question. That's how do you evaluate the effectiveness of a program? And, um, you know, it's very important that you measure what you actually want to know. And what we typically do is to substitute um, artificial metrics that are easy to measure for things that we really wanna know. And consequently, we look at the wrong thing and get the wrong answer. What I really wanna know is how students behave years from now. You know, did, 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 this view of the world make a difference to them? And, and I can't ask that. The only thing I can ask right now is, are they interested? Are they, are they enjoying it? Um, but I can't ask the question that I wanna ask. And, and, and so some things are just unknowable. Um, but I just will share a personal experience with you is, um, when I was in graduate school, I took a course in engineering um, where we used to, a small group of students, six or eight students would get around a table with an engineering uh, faculty member. And he would talk about a problem that he wanted us to try to figure out and solve. And we'd just sit and talk about it for an hour. And the next week we'd toss it, talk about another problem. And there was nothing I could take away from that to say I've learned something. But when I look back on it, I feel that it was a much more important experience in my life than a lot of other things I took. Um, so very difficult to evaluate some things. I am not saying that get the answer in the short term because the, the, the experiments that I mentioned are not, in, not quite experimental in, in that sense because when, the, when, when that program is come out by MIH, it is just a training course and they don't fall about the, the outcome of students. It's later some econometricians go through the material of those uh, data and collect the data about the, the, the fate of those students and then they come out of these conclusions. But if at the beginning of the program design, you already have the idea of tracking the outcome many years later, that will be a solid uh, in, in the sense that we can, we can into records. So that's what I mentioned about have you like come out of program and, and decide something to measure about the feedback even just many years later. Yeah, that, that's really great when you can do that and when people take the, the effort and the time to do that to get long-term results, terrific. Dr. Hurl, I have a, well. a question real quick. Um, so about your perspective on science and how uh, uh, tinkering and like your uh, your steps of science of a, your what phenomena do you observe and what are your questions about that and the experiments that it leads to? Um, 
Could you talk a little bit about your Nobel Prize work and the uh, cell cycle checkpoints and how? No. No. Yes? Very bad. Outside, Arlo. Outside. No, Arlo. <laughs> Sorry about that. I did a quick mute, but yeah. If you could just talk a little bit about like your perspective on science and how that kind of influenced your career and the work that you've done. Um, yeah. Um, so when, when I left graduate school, um, I, I, I think from my training as an undergraduate at Caltech, I felt like it was uh, incumbent on me to choose something unknown <laughs> to try to contribute to. And um, being a biologist, um, I chose cell division because it was, it was uh, important in biology and pretty unknown. Um, I went to a famous laboratory, Renato Del Becco's laboratory that was studying animal cells and culture and um, was sort of at the forefront of that field. I spent a year and a half there and decided I couldn't learn anything from animal cells. <clears throat> I just, you just couldn't do things with them that were definitive in, in my view at the time. So I was kind of frustrated and um, uh, took a job and um, was starting my research and, um, and, and thought about it some more. It actually was a very nice time. It was about three to three months or so while I was waiting for my laboratory equipment to come that I had nothing to do but think about it. <laughs> and, um, and what I realized was that phenomena that I, uh, uh, areas of research that I really admired in biology, um, such as how genes were regulated and how viruses were built uh, had been learned using genetics. And so um, with some advice from some colleagues, I decided to see if I could uh, find a single celled organism that was eukaryotic and had genetics that you could do good genetics with. And that led me to yeast. And so I did my research in yeast. Um, so, you know, I guess one can conclude what one wants from that. But in my experience, um, I was lucky, I think in hindsight that um, I was discouraged and frustrated by things that wouldn't work and um, had the time to look for something that, um, that might work. Thank you. Excuse me, professor. Hello, my name is Adam and I'm a student at the University of Michigan. I actually uh, took a class taught by uh, Stephen and Indika. And I wanted to ask you a question um, regarding the topic, I guess, of the whole discussion. Um, in middle school and high school, um, one of the biggest reasons why I was dissuaded from science was because I had teachers who did not care. They only kind of regurgitated stuff from textbooks that was part of them getting a paycheck. Um, how can you see, I guess, the future of teaching the scientific process and getting students to really, and, and faculty, um, to enjoy um, teaching science that isn't necessarily contingent on schools cutting deals with textbook makers. And um, I guess maybe this is a, this is, I guess, a really big question, but nevertheless, you inspired me to ask. Um, well, um, I, I, I think that you, you, you know, I, I don't think the, 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 the textbooks so much drive the process, but what does drive the process uh, are numbers. That is, it's hard to um, mentor students if there's too many of them. 
Um, so I think that the kind of class I like to have, each student is doing their own project and I'm kind of a guide and I need to be interested in what they're doing and helping them think about it, but it's their thing. And so I have to have a lot of divided attention. And I'm finding that this, this semester, I have 26 students. Um, and Dika will share with you that he, he works a similar way. And the numbers get uh, forbidding if they get too much bigger. And so, um, so I think it's a numbers game in, in my mind that, that mentoring students to think um, requires that you not have too many. I understand. Yeah, I took a bioinformatics class with Indica, which was one of my favorite classes I've taken at Michigan. And we definitely went over that way of thinking where we kind of broke down. We took a lot of time breaking down really important mathematical formulas and processes over a course of multiple class periods and really analyzing them in depth and asking really good questions and focusing more on the quality of the material rather than the quantity of the material learned. And um, yeah, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Thank you. Eddie. Lee, it's Gil Oman. I have a comment for you. I loved your reference to young children full of why questions. And my lament has always been that parents and teachers and I guess well meaning other people very often suppress those questions. If they're too persistent or they don't have an idea how to frame an answer. But it seems to me the real answer is just to be maximally encouraging of curiosity and see where it leads. Um, on the 125th anniversary of Science Magazine some years ago, we did a special issue on things we do not know. That's just what you said. We're so often celebrating what we've learned and what we can do or we think we can do. And we teach people to bow and praise. But there are some amazing questions in all kinds of scientific fields that are still wide open. And putting an emphasis on framing the questions and thinking about how you might go to answer them, just as you laid out, seems to me one of the most productive things we can do. And I refer all of you to that. I think it was, um, it was 125th anniversary. So it was probably 2009. Anyway, Science Magazine, 125 things we do not know in science. I encourage you all to take a look. And of course, make your own lists. That's, that's terrific. I appreciate that, uh, Gil. Yeah, I, I think when we teach, we should teach uh, questions as much as answers. And, and, and answers are pretty boring before the questions. So um, much more prominent place for questions. <laughs> oh, Lee, <laughs> this is Jim. Hello. Hello, Jim. I, I think... Uh... You know, everything you said resonates very strongly with me, and we probably went through similar experience through our education process, uh, which for me was very discouraging until I got to Caltech, and that kind of changed my outlook about science. Um, so I wanted to just ask um, about this question of asking questions. So you, you had this beautiful example with Mendel, who I mean, there were lots of people doing science and of course, lots of things unknown about uh, genetic inheritance, but it took some particular insight to ask a question that was testable in a way that would lead to new understanding. And um, everybody else doing in that field was not asking good enough questions. So it's not just enough to tinker. I mean, this is, maybe this is sort of the starting place that we have to start from and we don't even do that well in, in K through 12 right now or even undergraduate but does asking the right questions kind of become emergent from from that foundation if if we have that foundation or is there still something missing that we need to get at how do you how do you learn how to ask good questions yeah well that in itself of course is a wonderful question <laughs> um I certainly don't know the answer to that, but um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think you know the big the big frontier in science is people, 
you know, we're, we're just very mysterious beings. And these things we do, like ask questions, um, is, is, you know, worthy of a lot of study. And, and um, I, certainly, I certainly would be interested in learning more about how we can ask better questions. Yeah, one reason I ask that is because we have this whole field now of artificial intelligence, which is, is again, most of the AI constructs are, are trained to learn the right answer that they are given in, in the supervised learning. Um, I don't think anyone is training AI to ask questions. Um, and I'm not sure how it would go about training it to ask good questions, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah, very interesting idea. May I ask a question? Yes, Thomas. Uh, I mean, when you think about what kind of questions uh, you want to ask or you should ask, uh, I remind, uh, I think it was uh, Jim York who said, uh, we need a literate population. And I mean, a democracy needs a literate uh, population, uh, people who are, are able, who want to think critically. If one takes that in account, uh, one should driven, also be driven by questions who take responsibility for that goal to maintain a democracy uh, in, in our time and to educate people that by on all the highly interesting questions scientists can ask. It is important whether we maintain dignity, whether we survive this century. And that is a question which really goes beyond to be driven, say, by nuclear organization or by cell cycle whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Good. What is our, I think, uh, apart when I think about uh, questions we want to ask, uh, our curiosity, that means also, where are my limits? Why can I not answer this question by myself? Whom do I need to ask? Uh, who has to be in the boat uh, to uh, answer a question. And what are the limits of a scientific effort? People, human beings suffer. <laughs> and they have many, many other things in life, uh, which is beyond our curiosity. Mm. Thank yeah, you. That, that, that question of, um, of how uh, social um, interaction uh, increases the value and ability to ask questions is also a wonderful dimension. Yeah. It is wonderful. Any other questions from Dr. Hartwell? Hi, Dr. Hartwell. Thank you for the great talk. And I'm a Sudarshan and I'm a a postdoc at the dermatology department. I work on like computational work. So my question is that, I mean, how do you see doing science as a career versus doing science as a passion? So how do you tell a student that science can be a passion, it should not be like a career, right? So, so what are your thoughts on that? How do you convey that message? Um, uh, I, yeah, so I think, um, I think I understand what you're saying is um, how, how can we um, encourage science as a passion rather than a career? Yeah, I, I think one of the things I find sort of discouraging is the fact that so many students I see are um, constructing their curriculum vitae, right? Their resume uh, with this experience and that experience and they're planning you know, how their strategy, they're strategizing their career rather than following their interest. 
And um, it just seems sad to me because I mean, it must be the, the system we put them in that leads to that kind of thinking. But um, I've never been able to do anything but follow my interest. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a very satisfying approach to life. And I would like to encourage students to be able to just follow their interest. Hi, Dr. Hartwell. Um, my name is Raha. I'm a PhD student um, in biomedical engineering here. Um, and I kind of had a follow up uh, question to your comment on mentorship kind of being limited by the uh, teacher to student ratio. Um, and I guess like how, how do we approach teaching science when practically we are limited, especially in K through 12 by the amount of resources we have or the amount um, the district or state is willing to invest in science education, because um, especially you were talking about how kind of starting the process of understanding what science is and doing science early on impacts the choices we make later. Um, and it doesn't even have to lead students to become scientists, but even under having a comprehension of what science is, even if they're not going to follow a scientific career path, I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on how you do that with the restraints we have like in our education system right now? Well, I, I guess the only approach I can think of is a sort of pyramid scheme where you, um, you, you train students um, to uh, have the philosophy you want them to have, and then you use them to educate the younger students <laughs> so that um, I think, you know, if you have undergraduates, um, typically I get undergraduates as sophomores and they tend to hang around till they're seniors. And by the time they're juniors and seniors, they can really help a lot of other students themselves. Um, so maybe, maybe that's how we have to expand our numbers. Uh, thanks for such a stimulating session guys i think dr hartwell thank you so much again if you have no more questions and uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, my, my pleasure you know. and please uh, email me if you have thoughts that uh, i can think about <laughs> Yeah, and thank you, Indika, for bringing us all together. It's fantastic. I mean, yeah. uh, you've uh, held the crowd the whole time, and it's uh, the kind of thing that we need to be doing more of. And Dr. Hartwell, we're all grateful to you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.